Hello, Mumbai. Hello, Mumbai. This is Raleigh, North Carolina. Can you see us? We can see you clearly. I can see the Narmada River. Hello, Mumbai. Can you see us? Why, there you are. Well, hello there. Well, now that we can see each other, let me introduce myself. I'm Roy Campbell. I'm Director of Exhibits and Digital Media at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. And I'm looking out on our daily planet globe, a capstone of our facade. A little later, you'll see a little bit more of it as we go on our tour today. Our museum is tasked with collecting and telling the stories of one of the most biologically and geologically diverse places on the Earth. And today we're going to take a tour through some of our exhibit galleries so that you can see what, what we have in store. So let's get started. Ready to jump off? Well, congratulations, you've landed. We're at, now in the Acrodome. As you can see on our flights over, though, we've, around the globe, we've had a little bit of a, encountered a little bit of a difficulty. It appears as though we're 115 million years in the past, the early Cretaceous to be exact. The pterosaurs are a species known as Anangera. They were fish-eating pterosaurs that glided just in a cushion of air above the water and scooped up fish from the surface with their toothy bills. The Acrodome is where we also have one of our prized specimens, the Acrocanthosaurus, which lays below us. So let's take a flying leap and I'll tell you more about it. So here we are, it seems we've landed in the heart, or perhaps the stomach, of the Acrocanthosaurus. This is a beautiful specimen, the only specimen of its kind in the world 60% of this specimen exists in our collection. The reason it's called the Acrocanthosaurus is because it is a high-spined lizard. That's its translation. Many people could confuse this with the Tyrannosaurus rex, but the Tyrannosaurus rex reigned supreme many millions of years later in the late Cretaceous period. Some people say that the the T-Rex was something of a, uh, a roadkill specialist or maybe a nest robber. This was a very robust killer. And I'll show you some of the features of it. Of course, the T-Rex is well known for having two talons on its forearms. But here you can see on the Acrocanthosaurus, there are three talons, tailor-made to grab hold of their victim and sink their teeth deeply into it. So a T-Rex had tremendous bite force, and its teeth were these blunt objects, something like my thumb, that could just mash through bone. The Acrocanthosaurus, on the other hand, was really at the cutting edge. These are meat-slashing teeth. Coupled with the talons, they could lay into their victim and then deliver a mortal blow. Having delivered a devastating bite, the Acrocanthosaurus might back away to avoid the slashing tail of a brontosaurid. It would take its time, look for its opportunity, and then go in for the killer bite. So we've stared down a giant from 115 million years ago. Let's now take a leap forward to see some of the giants of the deep that are in our collection. So here we are in the marine hall of the museum a very large hall that can easily swallow you up. I'm standing right now inside the mouth of a blue whale. Blue whales are the largest animals ever to exist on planet Earth, far larger than seismosaurs and gigantosaurs. In this large gallery, we've suspended four great whales from the ceiling, a total of over five tons of whalebone. To give you a better view of these majestic creatures, we're going to take you on a fly-through through the gallery right now.
about 50 million years ago, after India had collided with the continent of Asia and the, and the Himalayas were under construction, there was an explosion of life on Earth. And some of those species, four-legged animals that lived on the land, found that they had better pickings in the tidal waters and in the estuaries and rivers. And the more that they hunted, and the more, that they, the more they evolved, until they developed strong tails for propulsion through the water. Those bones are the vestigial hind legs of those four-legged animals of 50 million years ago. And they occur in all of the great whales. So right now, I'm standing inside one of the oldest members of the collection of the museum. This is Mayflower, the right whale, that was harvested in 1876, in the month of May, hence its name, Mayflower. If you look at a map of North Carolina, out into the Atlantic, you'll see a necklace of islands. On one of those islands lived a community. The communities along the barrier islands would keep an eye seaward to see whales migrating up and down the shore. And when they spied one, they would take out their longboats and give chase. In this particular case, it took seven hours after they harpooned it, seven hours to bring it to heel. And then after that, they had to row it ashore. Some 50 tons of whale, perhaps, that they would have to bring back to shore. It was late at night at that point. So the people on the shore lit fires so that the men, seven miles out to sea, almost over the horizon, could see their way home. So actually, we have not one, but two right whales in our collection. By the way, two right whales don't make a left. The other whale we're going to go to now in the other building, and I'll tell you a different story that's more than 100 years apart. Same species of whale, completely different story. So why would we have two whales in our collection? More than 100 years apart. Well, as you see, the markings on this whale are different than the other right whale that you saw. This whale is actually a research subject. When modern whales are washed ashore, researchers do a lot of work on them to find out the causes of death and many other things about metabolism and so forth. This particular whale was struck by a ship. And you can see where it was struck right here. This is this part of the skull. The ship rammed and fractured the skull of the whale. But the interesting thing is, is that this jawbone right here was not cracked. Instead, it flexed. And one of the researchers, a very smart person, wanted to know what kind of blunt force impact was necessary to flex a bone such as this so that the bow of the ship could actually strike the center of the skull and kill it. So what you see here are corings that she took. She made compression and extraction uh, tests to see what the strength of this bone was. She put sensitometers on it and weighed it down to see how much it would flex. She got enough data to, from doing that to actually turn it over to some engineers. They were able to work out what was the blunt force impact. And from knowing that, they were able to extrapolate what was the speed of the boat. How fast did a boat need to be moving in order to kill a whale such as this? So when the, when the researchers and engineers were able to establish how fast a boat needed to go in order to kill one of these whales, that became the basis for new legislation which, which enforced a rule that whenever these whales are migrating, and they migrate once up the east coast in the spring and then down again in the fall, that in those time zones, you could almost call them school zones, all shipping traffic needed to slow down. So all shipping now during migration season must slow down to 10 knots 
first to give these whales an opportunity to move out of the way, and second, in the event that they did strike one of these whales, there was a chance for survival of the whale from the impact. This research and the legislation were critical for the survival of this species. In the Southern Ocean, right whales are in fairly good population size. But the North Atlantic right whale, there are only some four to 500 of them that exist, which is simply not a big enough gene pool for them to really be a viable population moving forward. So the legislation, the first the research and then the legislation informed a policy that could help preserve these species on the planet. So today you have seen just two galleries in our museum. If you go to naturalsciences.org and look for the virtual tours, you'll be able to find many more examples of the biodiversity, the geodiversity of North Carolina, and the cosmic diversity, I might add. <laughs> um, um, this gallery, you'll have to be a little bit more patient to find out more about the story of, of, of Stumpy the whale, the right whale. Um, but just as a maybe a little bit of a reward for you, we're going to give you also a sneak peek in another exhibit. It'll be two years off before you'll actually be able, the public will be able to see that. But if you keep tuned in to our museum, you're going to find out lots of things along the way. So let's take you back hmm, 65 million years ago. How about that? Uh, does anyone here fancy a T-Rex, perhaps? Let's go see. So not everybody gets to go behind the scenes in the museum. And here we are, deep inside our collections, before our two new acquisitions, the world's most perfectly preserved specimens of a Triceratops and a T-Rex. So let's take a closer look, shall we? A magnificent pair of the world's most popular dinosaurs is being gifted to the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in downtown Raleigh. This incredible gift from a nonprofit organization will help launch a global paleontology research and education project. The dueling dinosaurs are a Cretaceous coal case, 67 million years in the making. They are the best preserved skeletons of Triceratops and T-Rex unearthed to date, including the only 100% complete skeleton of a T-Rex yet discovered. The skeletons are preserved in a potential predator-prey encounter with Tyrannosaur teeth found embedded in the Triceratops body. We have a lot of ideas we need to test. Uh, were these two animals dueling or fighting at the time they died? Was the Triceratops already dead and being fed on when another angry Tyrannosaur came along? What, were these young Tyrannosaurs actually pack hunters that attacked on the wrong day? Uh, there are so many different scenarios for how these animals ended up buried together that we as a scientific team have to sort through. The dinosaur carcasses have not been studied and remain entombed within sediment from the Montana hillside where they were discovered. Because of these rare burial conditions, each bone is in its natural position and museum scientists will have access to biological data that is typically lost in the excavation and preparation processes. The odds of finding two complete specimens with skin impressions and body halos entwined together in a single grave from 67 million years ago are incredibly rare. Uh, and that makes this specimen really a phenomenon. Inspired by these phenomenal fossils, design is nearing completion on a globally unique behind the scenes visitor experience at the museum in downtown Raleigh. The renovation will include high-tech exhibit spaces and an area where visitors can explore the tools and techniques used by paleontologists. The North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences is absolutely thrilled to house and research dueling dinosaurs, one of the most important paleontological discoveries of our time. Not only will we be able to uncover new details of their anatomy and behavior, but a new dedicated facility will engage audiences across the world on these discoveries. The facility will feature a science laboratory dubbed the SECU Dino Lab, where museum guests will have a unique opportunity to enter the lab and talk directly with the paleontology team. 
This state-of-the-art lab will also feature live video feeds so the world can follow along as paleontologists uncover their discoveries. It is anticipated that the dueling dinosaurs will become a must-see icon at what is already the state's most visited attraction. Construction is slated to begin in 2021. Wow, I can't wait to open the exhibit so that they get a chance to see what you've had a sneak peek at today. Well, that ends our personal tour today, but you can take a virtual tour anytime you want. So when you get here, you'll go to exhibits and then you'll go down here to virtual tours. And then when you go on the virtual tours, you can look at all of these different uh, tours. Uh, let's go check out the uh, Terror of the South, the Acrodome here. Um, we have already seen it, uh, we've already taken you in here, but uh, let's go in for a virtual tour. You can uh, just basically walk around and look around. You can look up, look all the way around. And you can click on these hot spots and get um, lots of information. Um, and you can uh, just do whatever you want to do. You can just look around and uh, really cool. You can just uh, walk around our museum just as you want. You can even uh, kind of go off the beaten trail here. You, you want to stand underneath a uh, sauropod, you can do that. Um, you want to come over here and stand where I was standing. Look at this, right up the back and look right behind Acro. So lots of cool stuff you can do. So check back with us often and take a virtual tour anytime you'd like. But I'm sure you might have some questions today from our personal tour. So over to you, Mumbai. Well, good evening. Good evening to all the conference attendees. I see a few questions that are coming in. Uh, one here is about when the dueling dinosaurs will be available to the public. So we are doing uh, design work right now and we have some construction ahead of us, uh, which will start this spring. And of course we have conservation work that has to be done by our paleontology department. Uh, but we will be opening up to the public in 2022. So maybe that's um, a ways away to go. Maybe it's 18 months or more, but uh, we're working as fast and feverishly as we, as we can. But you have to remember that these fossils are 66 million years old. So maybe it's worth the wait, worth the wait to see them. Um, and then I have another question. What are the methods for bone preservation technique? Um, and would the dueling dinosaur source be available online? So once we are open, we will actually have cameras stationed on top of each of the specimens. The, the, the two specimens were found together, but in order to ship them, uh, there was very many tons uh, involved in bringing those. So they're actually in basically five very, very large blocks. And uh, you saw perhaps in the video, it, it was time-lapse, you could see us bringing them into the building. We actually had to put, uh, take doors off the building to get to fit them in, because uh, they barely squeaked through the actual door frames. And then we had to lay in one inch steel plate on the floor to spread the load as we brought them into the building. Um, the conservation work that we do on them is going to be very um, intense. That uh, first of first and foremost, in fact, it might take more than two years for actually us to, to do the conservation work. But um, part of the process, because the specimens have a body halo, so under certain spectrums that we use uh, of light spectrums um, and wavelengths, um, you can actually see the, a body halo. Um, 
the top part of them as they exist today has they, the, the matrix, the surrounding uh, earth and soil from, from back then, 67 million years ago, which is now much, much harder, sedimentary rock, has been chipped away. But what we understand is, is that beneath that, so in other words, if you turn these upside down and work from that way, you will actually be able to find skin impressions that have been preserved, even perhaps stomach contents in, in, the, in the individuals. So that will actually happen in the lab. We will, in the, in the process over the next several years, actually turn these upside down after we've scanned as much as possible, scan them again, we'll use CT scans as well, very high technology. And then we will very, very carefully go down. We will not go down to the bone. If we find the skin, we will leave that skin. That is evidence that must be preserved for all time. Must be preserved, same as in archaeology, where you preserve things so that new technology that comes along, perhaps decades later, can tell you even more than you can tell in the present time. Um, all of that will be with a stationary cameras above each of the five blocks and then we'll have a time lapse of the entire sequence and so we will be during all of that process be uh you'll be able to come to the exhibit and see those that camera work but we also will put that out online so that people can see it and our paleontologists who are very very good communicators will actually be able to talk through what what is actually happening and what their theories might be uh, the questions mostly it's going to be a lots and lots of questions uh you might have heard uh lindsay zano who's our, our head paleontologist saying this is an open question it's a kind of like a crime case and we're not quite sure it's a it's a big who done it uh they may have killed each other in the process or they may have by chance uh, come together but that's not Often that happens uh, where um, species are caught up in a flood and then they're caught in, a, in an oxbow, perhaps, of a river. But that's lots of things have thrown into that, and it's a big tumble. It's like a compost heap. In this particular case, that is not the case. These are found in very, very good condition, and it, it appears as though uh, – because there's still more work to be done – but it does not seem as though there was a lot of that they were thrown together, like floated down a river as carcasses, and then came to, came to came to rest. There seems to be more to it than that, and we know that they were preserved, preserved very very rapidly. There doesn't appear to be a lot of of um, rot or tearing by predators that would tear these these uh, species a lot uh, apart. So let me see if what else we've got here on the um, on the chat line here. I'm really glad that you could uh, join that we could join you this morning. Of course, now in Raleigh for us Saturday morning, but I know it's uh, Saturday evening there in India. And uh, thank you for for staying up and 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 uh, staying close so we can uh, enjoy this time together. How is the estimation? How in the estimation? done with regards to fat content, muscle, anatomy, et cetera, only from the fossil remnants. So what are computer graphics and virtual and augmented reality technologies are you using? So I have a very good technician, Matt Jones, uh, next to us. Uh, he's been working feverishly with me to put together the presentation this morning. He can tell you more about that. But the technology that you that's employed where you can navigate through our museum and, and go as you wish, that technology was actually created for, um, for, re for selling houses. I would imagine it's the case in, 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 in India, it's certainly in the United States. If you want to go house hunting, you do that online and you actually can tour through the museum. It's the very same technology, the same company one of the same companies, and it's called Matterport, M-A-T-T-E-R-P-O-R-T, -T -T -E Matterport. Um, very, very good technology. Um, it's, uh, there's, a, there's an art to stationing the camera so that you knit everything together. We had, a, we had a learning curve sometimes because we were actually, for instance, the sequences that you saw of us through the Marine Hall 
in order to knit that together three-dimensionally, because it was three-dimensionally from the first floor, but it was three-dimensionally from the second floor, and you might choose to navigate on your own from the first to the, to the second very rapidly, we actually had to figure out how to do that. We had to go up a set of escalators and record all of the escalator moves and then come together again on the second floor so that the computer software itself can knit all of that together. Of course, we extracted all of the information that was of going up an escalator. That wasn't necessary for you to, to see that. And so, um, but it's very, very, uh, um, we've had a lot of excitement working with that, uh, with that software. And we're really happy that uh, people can come to our, our museum. We are open right now, uh, but, but due to the, uh, to the pandemic, uh, we're only letting in a, a much reduced number, maybe 25% of our usual visitation in the museum right now. So schools and, and people at home and people all around the world actually now can come to our museum and navigate them by themselves and find some of the hot spots and find out little bits of information along the way. We're really happy that we can continue to do that. Uh, so let me see if I can go to another question here. Um, we have also read maybe rumors <laughs> like di dinosaurs may have scales uh, and feathers instead of what we picture currently. How do we come to these conclusions? Can you tell us more about the asteroid impact extinction event? Well, I'll try my best. I have to tell you something, though. This is uh, truth, truth in, in advertising. I am an exhibit designer. I have an art degree. I do not have a science degree, uh, but I've been very, very fortunate. I've been here at this museum for almost 30 years. And because of that, I've learned lots and lots of things from all of our sci science uh, uh, science uh, um, department. We have scientists in many other fields, herpetology, that's snakes, reptiles, amphibians. Uh, we actually have uh, researchers that actually do work in Asia. Uh, they've done work in Cambodia and on other areas like that where there are endangered species and still to be discovered species actually. Uh, some of that they do, strangely enough, they go to marketplaces and sometimes they'll find the, the wild catch and find new species actually in, in marketplaces. But they work with the, uh, the, the resident scientists in those countries and assist them in the work that, that can be done to find out the taxonomy uh, and so forth and the health of, of, uh, of populations. That's a, a lot of our work goes on that way. So we do rept reptiles and amphibians. We do uh, birds, of course. Uh, and of course, mammals. Uh, we do also do other work in mussels, freshwater mussels, which are actually a, a very significant environmental uh, health indicator. They indicate the health of a, of a river. Gone off on a little bit of a tangent there, so because the question was more about scales and feathers. Yes, so uh, a paleontologist told me this the other day that paleontology has learned more about dinosaurs in the last 10 years than they ha have in the preceding 100 years. The availability of fossils to be able to find them with because of new technologies, because of mining sometimes and other things like that, um, and the technology that they're actually using. So it, it's a, there's a kind of a conception that you find a dinosaur, there it is, and so you just chip away all of the rock that's around it you mount that specimen, there it is for everyone to see, the skeleton. That's not how paleontology is done today. It's almost like a crime scene. In fact, there are instances where uh, some of our paleontologists associated with our museum have actually gone in with a mash unit to a particular area, a specially developed uh, vehicle. They've gone in and they've actually put in, uh, put on uh, gloves as you as you would in a in a crime scene, because they do do not want to contaminate actually the site, and then they very very meticulously work, because there's all of this evidence. It's not just the bone; it's what's surrounding it. It's the other biota. The 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 we will actually be doing this. That we have one of our projects with dueling dinosaurs is actually to work on the micro 
um, world that is surrounding, that's in the surrounding earth. So there are remnants of vegetation, pollen spores, uh, small rodent teeth, uh, scales and scoots that might be off of lizards or turtles. All of those things, that surrounding evidence tells us more about the environment in which these existed. So it's a, it's a very fascinating field here. My compatriot right now is actually giving, writing a note, um, imaging. Uh, yes, so we are using C scans, MRI. Those are technologies that we use. Thank you, Matt. That, that was Matt Jones, the man behind the curtain that's making this all possible on our end. Uh, so it's a very, very cutting edge field in, in these days, uh, 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 um, pa paleontology. And the reason for it is because that was a, in the Cretaceous period, that was a hot house environment. Some people say that's where we're sort of going right now with global warming. And so we can learn a lot from the past that it helps inform the present and the future. And that's one of the reasons for, for paleontology. It's not about dead animals. It's very much about, it's a very lively profession um, and a pursuit and has um, great and many stories uh, to tell about us, about life on earth and how we may continue. Uh, there was another question that was about actually the, the KT extinction, they're calling, so that's the commentary, uh, the, the bolid impact that happened on the uh, Mexican peninsula. That was uh, some 65 million years ago that did uh, develop a devastating blow, particularly in North America. And of course it wiped out the vast majority of, uh, of dinosaurs. Of course, some dinosaurs and some mammals did actually persist through that period. Uh, most notably the birds, the raptors. So a T-Rex is actually a raptor. There is characteristics in its hands or its claws and so forth. There was already um, evolutionary branches of dinosauria that were into the into the bird realm, and they were because of mobility uh, and so forth, and their scavenging habits and other things like that were able to persist. They continued to evolve, but of course, when you see a when you see a bird today, you are actually looking at a dinosaur. Um, so let me see. Uh, and then I, I should say this, you know, it's well known about the asteroid impact in Mexico that was, was the demise of so many uh, of the dinosaurs. But there in India, you have the, you have the uh, Degen Traps, uh, which was highly volcanic uh, in its time, right around that period of time. And so paleontologists, uh, many paleontologists contend that it was not simply the impact of the asteroid, but there was also the, the effluvium that was coming from these very prodigious and productive uh, uh, volcanoes that were in the subcontinent of India at that period of time. And that also con contributed to a blocking out the sun because of all of the, the um, clouds that it set up of, of pumice and, and, and gases and so forth, that that depressed the vegetation and that in, in, in turn uh, starved many species to, uh, to, uh, out of existence. So, Nisarag, I see your name there. I'm wondering how we're doing, if you want me to uh, keep going or if you'd like me to, to sign off. Yes, so like uh, the questions are over. Okay. In the chat, we don't have any questions. Okay. So thank you, thank you very much for this opportunity. It's been uh, it's a green a great opportunity, and uh, let's do this next year. We'll maybe have some more uh, time, some more questions, and we'll show you a little bit more about our museum. I wish you all the best with your with your conference. Uh, it's really outstanding, and what I've seen, it's just incredible what you can do. I want to thank uh, Rahul and Nisarg so much for giving us this opportunity, as well well as Shivam. And uh, thanks again, and all the best to you and your conference. Have a great evening, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs>